Welcome to tonight's lecture. I hope everyone is fine. Yeah, so we are going to be looking at um, co-planner force vectors. So in case you have any questions as I'm going to be explaining or solving questions, you are free to interrupt me and I'll explain depending on your question. All right, so uh, if you have any queries in statics, mathematics, and other courses, feel free to contact me on, on any of these lines. And uh, the other thing is that I forgot to send you the materials and everything that you are going to be uh, using next semester, including uh, the other courses. I'm not, I'm not only going to send you for math and statics, I'll also add other courses like electronics and electricity, uh, engineering, drawing, and um, the other course, which is uh, material science. So I'm going to send you all the, uh, what's this, the contents in the group. What I'll do is I'll just uh, make a link and then I'll just make a link, um, a, a, a drive link, and then I'll send it to the group so that you can download. Okay, so let's uh, quickly begin. So um, from the objectives that you are seeing on the screen, the last time we met, uh, we covered the first point there. We, we learned how to add forces, how to resolve them in two components using the parallelogram, uh, law, um, and I gave you an exercise. And uh, from the exercise, I've observed that most of you, uh, let me say some of you have done well. Uh, some of you are just missing it uh, a bit. And uh, some of you did not submit. So I'm still waiting for the same exercise. And there's also another exercise that I've put in this slide, which you have to do and submit as well before we do, I mean, before we have our next uh, statics lecture. So those that did not submit, you have two exercises to submit. Yeah, so make sure that you're doing these exercises. That's how you are going to know if you are understanding or not. As long as you're not doing these exercises to be difficult for you to know if you have gotten the point or not. Yeah, so make sure that whichever exercise, whichever work I give you, you submit on time and you see how things are going to be flowing. Next semester when you open, it will be a walkover. The statics which people complain about to be a walkover, walkover with you. Yeah, it's a very simple course if you are just serious with what, um, I mean, with studying and you're just serious with your work. What we're doing is just introduction. We've not yet uh, started doing the real statics. So if you are failing to submit the, if you are failing to submit these simple, simple exercises, what more if we start doing the, uh, the major things that are in statics? We start doing the virtual works. We start looking at um, um, what is the central, the, finding the center of mass of uh, objects, finding the, the moment of inertias, those things. Those things, to tell you the truth, they are not friendly if you are lazy when it comes to solving. Yeah, so let's be submitting these exercises. Let's be moving on the same page. Okay, so um, tonight, like I said, we're just going to discuss the addition of uh, the system of coplanar forces. So one thing you have to understand about these types of forces is that when you talk about coplanar forces, these are just forces that are on the same plane. Yeah, so meaning you can have, uh, let's say for instance, you have, you can have uh, maybe two forces. Let me use white. You can have two or more forces coming from the same plane. So you can have maybe um, a force that is coming from there or another force is, come, is going this side. So you have F1, F2. Or sometimes you can have, maybe let's say we have a vehicle this side. Okay. Before I run out of bundles, let me just quickly purchase bundles. I've been given a notification this side. It might end before we finish. So let me just do that quickly.
Okay, so okay, so I was saying sometimes you may have, um, let's say you have a car this side. Um, should I use a car as an example? Okay, let me say you have maybe a person this side standing. You have a person standing this side, and then this person is holding a rope. And then this rope uh, is connected to one uh, beam this side, and another rope is connected to another beam this side. Yeah, so this is what you have. And then you might be asked to calculate the force that this, um, uh, that this guy, when, when this guy pulls uh, the rope, they might ask you to calculate the force that is in this particular rope and this particular rope alone. Yeah, so how do you do that? You use what are known as um, the cop. Uh, these are the types of forces that we're talking about, actually. These are the co planar forces, the forces that are in the same plane. All right, so let's quickly look at these forces. So when, when, when a force is resolved into two components along the X and Y axis, the components are called like uh, rectangular components. So when you have a force, if you have, let's say for instance, a force that is F, you have a force, and then this force has been resolved into two components, that is the X and uh, that is the X and the Y component. You have uh, F. We have uh, you express this force into the into two components: F in the X and also F in the Y. So these two forces are known as uh, the rectangular components. Yeah. So. Uh, um, on top of that, we also have what are known as scalar and Cartesian. We're going to discuss about that. Yeah, so how do you express these um, same forces or how do you show them if they ask you to say, find the scalar components of this uh, force or the Cartesian components of this force? So the only difference between the scalar and the Cartesian component is that, but to, if you are dealing with the scalar component, it's just um, you applying trigonometry you know to say when you're dealing with the X component in according to trig or the adjacent, if this is the theta that you have, if this is the angle that you have, and then you're dealing with the adjacent of uh, this angle. If you have theta here, which is the direction according to the forces. So if you have this theta there and they ask you to find the adjacent of this theta, which is F, of, uh, which is F in the X, so you can just draw a triangle there. You know that this is the opposite and the opposite in this case is the one that we have as our F in the Y. Yeah. So when you talk about the scalar components of this force, um, we talk about you using trigonometry to express these forces. So force, a force in the X can be expressed using trig as um, uh, the, uh, the, what's this, the force that you've been given there, which is the resultant force as the resultant force, um, the resultant force uh, cos, why, why are we using cos? Cos this theta. Why are we using cos? It's because we have this uh, F in the X as the adjacent using Sokatoa. So when you follow Sokatoa, 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 when you're dealing with cos, cos is the one that combines the adjacent and the given force, which is the hypotenuse in this case. So this force acts as the hypotenuse, and then the adjacent is the one that we have as our F, or our F in the X. So this can be written as cos theta, cos theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse, according to Sokatoa. So I'm just trying to go back to what you already know. So cos uh, theta will therefore be equal to what? So my adjacent here is the F, the, the force in the X, which is F of X, I mean, which is FX. And then the hypotenuse is the original F. So when you do the cross multiplication there, that's what brings us to this. So you have F times cos theta, you get um, F cos theta. And this will be equal to FX or the X component of this force. So this is how you solve that. 
So same applies to um, the other component, which is the force in the Y. So the force in the Y, you use sine, and this will be um, F, um, okay, let me just drive it also. So since we are dealing with the opposite to this uh, theta that you have, the opposite to this theta is Fy. So how do you deal with that? So we have the opposite and the hypotenuse there that has been given. So now, which trig ratio uses opposite and hypotenuse? Of course, it's time in the in the asis, in the Sokatoa formula. So we know to say sine theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So all these things that I'm showing you are going to be basics uh, where we are going. So these things I'm showing you are going to be basics. It's actually rare for you to find a question in an exam of in a, in a statics exam, which is as simple as what I'm showing you right now. It's rare unless the unless your lecture is just a good lecture and he wants everyone to pass. So it's rare for you to find such a question. So whatever that we are learning right now are simply basics of what we are going to start discussing. Yeah, so in other words, we're just revising first year physics. We're going to start the real statics. Maybe when you start looking at moments, beams, trusses, yeah, maybe those things we can call them at least it's statics. When you start looking at friction and other things, friction of course in details, all right, so uh, when I give you an exercise, make sure that you do it. Practicing will make you at least um, know something. Even if you get it wrong, it's better than you not doing it. If you get it wrong, at least I'll explain where you got it wrong and you understand. Meaning the next, the next complicated question that we're going to have, which is going to involve what you got wrong as a basic, uh, will be a walkover to you because you know how to deal with the basics. So the foundation is better than you just building without anything. Yeah, so this is why I'm here. I'm here to help you to build the foundation in statics. All right, so what you are learning is just, um, these are simple, these are basics. Yeah, so we were talking about the, what's this, the, uh, I mean, we're talking about the Y component of uh, this, uh, I mean, of, of this force. Yeah, so how do we deal with that? So uh, the opposite to this, um, to this theta that we have, which is the direction of this uh, force, the opposite is simply just um, uh, F, which is the, uh, the Y component of this force. And then the hypotenuse is the force itself, which is this one. When you do the cross multiplication, you have F in the Y being equal to, uh, you multiply the force times sine theta. So you have F sine theta. All right, so these two expressions that you are seeing, this one here and this one there, these are the ones that we are calling the scalar components of uh, this force, this force here. So the scalar components of this force are simply just what you are seeing right now, this one and that one. So in case they ask you to find the scalar components of any given force, these are the two that you're supposed to find. And then to find the magnitude of the resultant force, which is just um, FR. So FR is simply just found by, okay, before I talk about this, let me first, because um, I, I, I'll only be allowed to talk about this if we talk about the coplanar forces. Here, I'm just trying to show you how you, res re you resolve um, any given force into its scalar components, okay, or in, into its rectangular components. Yeah, so, these are the scalar components that you have. So now if we talk about the Cartesian components, so Cartesian components are simply just the scalar components, but you are going to show these scalar components in the, um, in the I and J format. Yeah, so in the I and J format, what do I mean? Okay, so you can have a force, I'm sure you've seen a force that um, had been expressed in a vector form as a i plus b j. If you, if it's in three dimension, you also have uh, uh, k there. So sometimes they'll use x 
uh, y and uh, z. So I'm sure you've seen such forces. So this is what we call the Cartesian component. And of course, the y axis is the one that we call the, um, the j. Yeah, so the y axis is the one that uh, always carries the j. And then the x axis is the one that has uh, i. And then the z axis, if we have the z axis, we can call that. So if we have, if it's in three dimension, and we are going to discuss these as well in three dimensions. So I'm just trying to introduce that as well. So in the y axis, if, if it's in three dimension, this one becomes our y. So this one becomes our y, and this is the one that is going to carry the j, and then this one is going to carry the z component, and this one will carry the i component. So when you talk about Cartesian uh, components, was simply talking about the i, j, k notation. And then if we talk about the scalar components, it's simply just uh, involving the cos and the sine. All right, so let's quickly begin to, to look at some questions. So I've explained about the scalar component and the Cartesian vector notation. Yeah, so this is what I was just explaining. Yeah, so the Cartesian, like I explained, the y carries the i, the y carries the j, and then the x carries the, um, yeah, the y carries the j uh, notation there, as you can see, and then the x axis carries the i notation. Yeah, so let me just see if there's something to explain on the next page. All right, so coplanar resultant or coplanar force resultants. So what I was just showing you was one force. If you look at this, we only had one force there. There's only one F there. Now, what if you have two forces? How do you combine those two forces? Or how do you find the resultant of those two forces? It's also very simple and straightforward. Let's look at this example. Okay, so we have F1, we have F1, have F1 and we also have um, F2 and F3. So we have F1, F2 and F3. So we have three forces in the same plane. So now how do we resolve these into their components and how do we find the resultant force? So the most important thing that you need to know here is that you need first to resolve them into their um, respective X and Y components and then Let's say, for instance, F1, F1, let me use white. Okay, so F1 can be expressed in its um, uh, X and Y component as uh, you can write it in Cartesian if you want, where you're going to have X, I mean, F in the X, um, I plus F in the Y, J, and then, F2 also be expressed in its um, components. So F1, as you can see, so F1, if you check, if you, if you look at F1, F1, the X component is, is uh, pointing towards the positive X axis. The Y component also post, uh, is also uh, pointing towards the Y, uh, I mean, the positive Y axis. This is why, uh, this is the reason as to why I've, I've put a, what is a positive there in between. So you don't just write signs anyhow. So let's look at the other component, which is F2. I mean, the other force, which is F2. And we see how the signs are going to differ. So when you look at F2, F2, um, the X component of F2 is pointing towards the negative uh, X axis. And then the, uh, the Y component of F2 is pointing towards what? The Y. Uh, pos I mean, towards the positive y axis. So this, I mean, for this reason, we expect to have the negative x. So we're going to have negative f x i and then plus positive f y j. So if we had z, we also add z this side. If we had the other z axis. All right, so we also look at f3. So f3, if you look at F3, 
it's important to consider the direction. So if you look at F3, F3, um, F3, the X component of F3 is pointing towards the positive X axis, and then the Y component of F3 is pointing towards the negative what Y axis. So we have our F3 as, so our F3 is therefore going to be equal to uh, F X I and then negative F Y J. So these are, so these are the components of both the X and the Y axis. So now the question is, how do you find um, the resultant force of such um, oasis of such coplanar forces? How do you find the resultant? So the resultant is simple. So the resultant is going to be found by saying FR is equal to. So what you do is you add all the um, F. Okay, let me to differentiate these. I'm going to put the subscript. So we have FX1, Y1, FX2, Y, uh, I mean FY2. Fx3, Fy3. And then to find the resultant, we are going to say um, this is going to be equal to Fx1 uh, and then negative Fx2 and then positive Fx3. And then this one who has, uh, I mean, it's going to um, have what? I, and then we say plus, for J we also do the same, we add FY1 plus FY2 negative FY3. And then we put our J this side. So this is the resultant force. Having found this, it's now easier for us to calculate the resultant uh, scalar component of this. So how do you do that now? So that one is found by uh, finding, so this, this, this part here can also be written as what? So if I want this part, I can just say, this is F resultant in the X. And then this other part can also be written as what? Okay, let me just write it this way. So here, this part I'm saying, we can write this as F resultant in the X. And then we put I there. Then we say plus, uh, this part is F resultant in the Y. Then we put J there. So now to find the final resultant force, which is in the scalar form. So the resultant force will therefore be equal to um, the square root of what? F resultant in the X plus F resultant in the Y. Of course, these are supposed to be squared. So this is how you find the final resultant force. Then what if they ask you to find the direction? So the direction is simply found by uh, finding um, the tan inverse. So theta is found by finding the tan inverse of what? Uh, tan inverse of F, um, Fy, Fy, F result and Y. Let me write it properly. Let me write it where you can see it properly. Okay, let me write it on top there. So theta is found by finding the tan inverse of the resultant vector in the Y over the resultant uh, vector in the X. So when you find the inverse of that, um, that will give you um, the tan, when you find the tan inverse of uh, the resultant forces in the Y and the resultant forces in the X, they are going to give you the direction of the um, resultant force. Yeah, so they, they are going to give you the direction of this force that you find there. Okay. So I've said a lot of things here. If you have not gotten anything or if you have gotten two or three things and you've missed out one point, this is the important of me recording this session. So you'll have to watch this video again. And then um, and again, there's an exercise at the end. You are requested to do it. Before we do, before we have our next statics uh, lesson on Monday, you need to do that exercise so that I just see if you are at to understanding the concept. So let's quickly move on. So this is what I was just talking about. So I've explained almost everything here. Yeah, so these are the, 
these are the forces. Yeah, so you can see exactly the things that I was explaining, uh, the ones that you're seeing on the screen. Yeah. So this is how you find the resultants. Okay. So I'm going to send the slide as well so that you can just go through it in case you need some clarifications at some point. Okay, so this is uh, what I was talking about. So this is how you use the scalar notation of um, the resultant forces. So it is not very much different from what we uh, saw there. Yeah, except that here, you can be using, except that when you're dealing with scalars, you are just using cos and, uh, you're just using cos and sine. Yeah, so that's the way it is. And then if you are using the, the what is the Cartesian notation, there you use i, j, and k notation. All right, we proceed. So Kuplana result, and so I've talked about these, yeah, so this is how you find the resultant. And then the angle is simply just the forces. Yeah, I forgot to put the absolute value symbol. So you have to put your solution in the absolute value a symbol. What does that mean? It simply means that any answer that you get there as a negative, you always have to find the turn inverse of a positive answer. Yeah, okay. Let's quickly look at this example. Okay, let me change the color of my marker. So we have this example, which says determine the X and Y components of F1 and F2 acting on the boom shown. Okay. Then express each force as Cartesian vector. So they're asking us to find or to determine the X and the Y component of F1 and F2. So how do we do that? So given the angles, it's simple. So how do we do that? Okay, so I'm going to start with F1. So F1, so F1, F1 has been given to be 200 Newtons. So to find the X and the Y component of 200 Newtons, I'm going to draw a triangle here. So I don't know if I should draw it the simple way or, okay, to make things easy, let me just be using the same format. Whether, yeah, I think I'll be using the same format throughout uh, my lessons. Yeah, because there are two ways in which you can do this. You can either make this triangle from this side or from this other side. So the best is, let me follow the angle. So I'm going to follow where the angle is. So the angle has been placed here. So if the angle is here, I'm going to put it this side. I think, let me just do this. Let me put it this side. And you know to say if this is 30 degrees, this is a 90 degrees angle. Meaning this one here is what? 60 degrees. So instead of using 30, I'll be using 60 degrees. So I'll put my 60 degrees there. Yeah. So, we can now begin to solve this question. So this question is simple. Uh, to find the X and Y components of this, I'm going to use the scalar uh, formula, the scalar notation. So the X and the Y component of this, uh, so F1 in the X is simply just equal to, given this angle, I'm going to draw the triangle there. And, and then I'm going to use 60 degrees. So the X component to this, um, part is going to be negative because it's pointing towards the negative x axis. And then x uh, component, I'll always be taking it as cos because, um, okay, not really taking it as cos because uh, this uh, component or this uh, side is adjacent to this angle. Hence, I'm going to use cos because cos is the one that deals with the adjacent and the hypotenuse. So I'm going to say negative 200, Cos, because it's adjacent, cos what? Cos 60, it's adjacent to this 60. So I'm going to put cos 60 there. So when you do that, you get your solution. So I say 200 uh, cos 60. So that's giving us a hundred. So this is a hundred Newton. And then F1 in the Y, 
this one will be equal to uh, the y component is pointing towards the positive y axis so it will remain positive we say 200 and because it's opposite to this angle we're going to say sine 60 and this will be equal to so we say 200 sine 60 this is giving us what 173.2 so this is going to be 173.2 newtons so i found the x and the y component of f1 let us also do the same for f2 okay so let us also do um uh the same for f2 so for f2 so f2 in the x is equal to when you look at the x component so the x component of f2 is uh, parallel to this side so we're going to use 12 so put 12 there over the hypotenuse which is what uh 13 but because it's pointing towards the positive meaning we'll leave it as positive there then we multiply this by what by 200 and when you do that you get your solution as 12 times 200 divided by 13 and this will be what 184.6 so we have 184.6 newtons. Then F2 in the Y will be equal to, so in the Y we have five there. I'm going to write five. And then over the hypotenuse, which is 13, over the hypotenuse, but because it's pointing, the Y component of this force is pointing towards the negative, meaning we're going to put the negative sign, the negative sign there. Then we put our 200 there. So from there, we can now do the calculation. So we have five divided by 13. Where? Uh, the, the force. On F2 or which one? On F2. It's saying two skis, not 200. Oh, it's supposed to be two skis. All right, thank you for that correction. Okay. So this one is two skis. So we do the calculations again. Okay, so, okay, that shows that you are following. Thank you very much. All right, so we proceed. So we have 260 uh, times 12 divided by 13. So we're getting 240. So 240 Newtons there. And then here we have um, 260 divided by 13, then times five is giving us what? 200, I mean, uh, I mean 100. So this would be a negative 100 Newtons. So this is how you find the X and the Y components of these forces. Yeah, so let us, um, check what they found. I think I had put the solutions. Yeah, so this is exactly what we have done. So this is for F2, 240 and 100. And of course, this one was supposed to, they were supposed to include a negative sign because it's facing down. Okay. And then for F1, this is what they found, which is exactly the same answers, the same solutions that we found. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Oh, there's also a part of us showing them in the versus the Cartesian form. So showing them in the Cartesian form is not difficult. You just use these same scalar components. This one is in the X. So you just put I on the X component. Let me, let me, let me do this. Okay, so uh, for F1, so F1 will be equal to um, uh, F1 in the X is equal to negative 100. So we can just say negative 100 I, and then uh, the Y component of this uh, force is what? 173, so this would be 173. So this would be 173. It, it's positive, so it will be one positive uh, 173 J. And for F2, you also do the same. 
yeah, for F2, you also do the same. So F2 also be, um, uh, we have um, positive X. So in the X, we have 240. So we have 240i. And then in the Y, we have negative 100. So if there's no negative in front, this side, I think when copying this solution, I was supposed to write the symbol as well. So I think there was an arrow which was supposed to point down. And so if you want, you can use arrows to show the direction or you can use the sign negative or positive. So we can put a positive, uh, a negative for the Y component of uh, F2. So there's supposed to be a negative there, negative 100 J. Yeah, so as you can see for this one, they are using arrows to point. This is the reason why for 100, when I solved for this, if you, if you check, there's a negative in front of this 200, but after multiplying, there's this 100 there. And then after that, they also showed it the, the other way by just writing the sign there and leaving it positive. Yeah, so you can either use this notation or this one, still fine, still the same. Yeah, so for this one, I think there was also supposed to be something like a symbol to show that it's going down. All right, so let's move on to the next example. Okay, the next example is this one. So we're just remaining with uh, one minute. And I believe if we don't finish this in this slide, we use the same link. You should join using the same link. We finish it up. All right, so this is also simple and straightforward. They are saying the link in the figure is subjected to two forces, F1 and F2. Determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. So here we have been asked to find the resultant force. So meaning we first have to find the components of these forces, and then we use the same components to find the resultant force. All right, so before I start solving this question, let me end the meeting. We join using the same link. Yeah.